So I'm going to call that the indexed for loop. And then I'm going to do a value for loop. So I'm going to use V. For every value, or for every element is what I usually do, but I'm going to call it value for now. For every value in the list, print that value. In some languages, this is called a for each loop. They actually have the keyword each in there for each value in L. So two kinds of for loops for traversing. That's the, uh, think like a computer scientist's term for going through a loop. Before I saw that, I called it iterating through a loop. You were iterating through every value in the loop. You were iterating through every index in the loop. Those will both do the same thing. It's going to print 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30. I'm going to call this one July 12, for lack of a better name. And it prints 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30. So if we have a string, can we go through and print every letter of the string on its own line? Let's find out. Name is equal to Bob Barker. Whoever. Can I do a value-based for loop? I want to find out. For every character in the name, print that character out. Is that going to work? Yep, that worked. Okay. So, here's an example again of strings acting just like lists. Now, why is that important? Well, both of these ideas are important because a lot of programming is stepping through lists and doing something. Updating the values in the list or using the uh, values in the list to update the screen. You know, video games. You, know, you got Skyrim or Call of Duty. You got all these characters running around on screen. They're probably stored internally as a list. You know, and then the computer is cycling through, you know, 30 times a second or whatever, reading that list and updating the positions of the stuff on the screen. Reading in text and parsing the text for useful information. Parsing just means examining each item in the text. For example, a password program. It says, uh, please enter a new password, create a new password, and you type something in and it yells at you that you didn't put in any uppercase letters or it didn't have any, you know, special symbols or something like that. We're going to write a password program, but we're only going to start it. And then um, the homework will be to finish it. To do that, we're going to need to know some string commands that we haven't used yet. Specifically, how do you know if something is a character? Or if something is a digit? Or if it is a special character? So that's really what we need to know. How to examine a character to see if it is a letter, a digit, Punctuation. Also, if it's uppercase or lowercase. Why do we care about that? Because our password rules must be a certain length. How long is our password? What's our minimum password length going to be? Somebody, yeah. Must have a length 
of 10 carrots. Must have at least two uppercase characters. And at least two lowercase letters. I'm going to change that word character to letter. Two uppercase letters and two lowercase letters. What else do you see in password rules besides the punctuation? Must have one special character. What, what else might make a bad password? If it's too short, it's a bad password. It's all lowercase, it's bad password. What else? What if they typed in a two words? It says, please create a new password. You type heck space no. Is that going to work? Probably not. So let's say no spaces. I read that actually makes it better. Yeah, it does. Yeah, if you allow spaces as the password, you can uh, encourage the user to come up with far better passwords. You know, a sentence like this, now is the time for all good programmers, you know, is way, way, way harder for a, an algorithm to crack than something like, you know, P cut, uh, you know, trying to think of something clever, you know, whatever, you know, like that. You know. That's shorter. Shorter is easier to crack in all cases if you're trying to crack something algorithmically. And it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, a recognizable word or whether it's all symbols. It's still easier to crack. So in general, the longer the password, the better. And so when you dissuade people from using long passwords, like if you set a, a maximum length, you know, on the other hand, is somebody really going to be able to remember a, a, an 80 character long password? Maybe not, but, you know, <laughs> if they feel like it, why not? People use these uh, password managers anyways, where they just type in the password once and then forget about it. Okay. If we come up with any more rules, we'll come back and add them. Okay, so we're going to need some counters. What do I mean by that? Up here where I had four CH in name, let's say that I wanted to count the number of uppercase B's in my name. Now, you may have used a different name, so you may want to change the character that you're counting. I don't really want to use the term BS. Okay, the number of B's. Number of B's. I started off as, at zero. And then I step through it looking to see if the character is a B. Now in this case, it's going to be very specific. It's looking for uppercase Bs. So for this, we're going to use a value loop again. For CH, for every character in the name, if that character is equal to a B, increase the counter of B by 1. And let's print out the number of B's. Name, comma, has, quote, comma, number of B, comma, B letters. Something like that. Care is not defined. Okay. What did I do wrong? I called it CH here, but I called it care there. My mistake. I need to change one of those. I think I'll just do that. All right, so it found two B letters in it. If your name had something different, count something else. Or change it to have a couple extra Bs. <laughs> The same idea is how you create running tallies. You know, if you want to sum all the values in a list of numbers, 
you set total equals zero, and then total plus equals the value that you just read. And then by the time you're done, it will have added all the scores or whatever. And so anytime you're stepping through a loop, the process is going to be kind of similar to this. You initialize some counter or some useful information, and then inside the loop, based on the values in it, you update that counter. You use that an awful lot in programming. If, if you wanted to check for if they input any uh, lowercase b's, could you put if and then b or lowercase b? You could, right, right. Whenever you're dealing with lowercase digits, excuse me, letters, there's kind of two broad approaches. One is just to convert the whole string to lowercase. But uh, that's not a good idea here. We're wanting to preserve our, our case. So if we want to count lowercase b's, we just do if ch equals b or ch equals lowercase b. Like that. Exactly. So if I change this to Bobby Barker. Now it's going to have a lot more B's than it did before, specifically four. There we go. All righty. So down here, our password program. Print. Let's put this in a... Eh. I'm going to leave the loop part up to you. So, let's input, enter your new password. Except that's dumb. I didn't store my input anywhere. Password equals input, enter your new password. This one's the easiest one to do, the no spaces. You can check to see if something has a space in it just by, or if a value exists in a string like this. Don't type this. But if 3 is in the list, 3, 4, 5, then do something. You see that keyword? That searches this list, and if it's true, it'll do whatever's in there. So we could do, if there's a space, in the password, something like that. Right, right. Yeah. But we're going to take a <laughs> slightly different approach, I think. Eh, I'm kind of torn on it. Yeah, let's do this. Let's initialize some counters. How many uppercase letters? How many lowercase letters? Must have some numbers in it. At least two digits. Must have a punctuation character. All right, so we've added a whole bunch of rules. We could use that tactic for counting the number of spaces. I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. So that's not going to be a counter so much as it's going to be what's known as a flag. A flag is a Boolean variable that's set either to true or false, and then you do some decision based on it. So, has spaces is equal to false. And we're going to need counters for every one of our other rules. What is the length of the password? Well, we could just use len. How many uppercase letters are there? Well, we don't know yet. Uppers is equal to zero. How many lowercase letters are there? Lowers is equal to zero. We need a counter for that. How many digits are there? We don't know yet. Digits is equal to zero. And how many punctuation? I'm going to call it pun. It's equal to zero. Eh, punct. <laughs> That'll work. I'm 
I'm really veering towards skipping that flag idea and just making a variable called spaces. I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to delete that line and change it to spaces is equal to zero. We're just going to count the number of spaces as we go along. All right, we need a loop that's going to update all of those counters. It's going to count how many digits there are, how many punctuation there are, how many spaces there are. So we need to know functions that will allow us to figure out each one of those things. So I'm going to put some comments down here. Just allow me to cheat for a moment. Is upper, is lower, is digit. Okay. So we're going to be using the following functions. Is upper. Come back. CH dot is upper. That's a function. CH dot is lower. CH dot is alpha. I don't actually think we're going to be using that one, but we might be. Let's define what these are. True if uppercase letter. True if lowercase letter. True if a character. Excuse me, if a letter at all. And then if it's a digit, if it's a number, ch is digit will return true. And then there's is space. You might think that is space is a little bit extreme because you could just do this. Don't type this if ch is equal to a space. But that wouldn't count tabs. So we're going to use actually ch dot is space, which also accepts tabs as spaces. So is space. True if a space or tab. That's probably enough. The only thing that's missing is how to count punctuation. And I think we're going to define punctuation as if it's not a letter or a digit or a space, you know, because if it's none of the above, then it's got to be punctuation. I don't think that there's a special character, I mean, a, a, a function for deciding. Okay, so we're going to need a loop. For every character in our password, we need to check all these things. Let's check to see the number of uppercase letters. If I'm so sorry, pardon me. Um, I'm calling symbols punctuation. There is no special function for determining symbols, so we're going to hack together a rule that says if it's not a letter or a digit or a space, it's a symbol. That's going to be how we define it. Could have called it something else better than punct. One time I called it specials, symbols. Symbols would have worked. Ultimately, everything's a symbol, though. So here we go. If ch dot is upper, we want to add one to the number of uppers. Uppers plus equals one. If ch dot is a space, the number of spaces plus equals one. Now let's go ahead and handle uh, specials, the punctuation. So its rule is going to be longer. If ch dot We're going to change the way this is written a little bit. If not, parentheses, ch dot is space or ch dot is digit or ch dot is letter. 
If it's none of those, then we know it's a punctuation mark. Punct plus equals one. Ashton Kutcher's gonna come get us. Now that's not that doesn't handle all of our rules, but it's a it's a start. Not handling lowercase, it's not handling digits. Really, by and large, it's got almost everything else in it, though. So, now let's print our password analysis. Now we need to print out all these variables. The length, the uppers, the lowers, the digits, the punctuation, and the spaces. That's going to be like six print statements. Print length equals comma length. Let's print the number of uppercases. Print the number of lowercases. <coughs> print the number of digits. Just two more. I should have copied and pasted my print statement. Print the number of punks. It should be. I made a mistake here. If you compiled this, you'd get an error. I need to fix that. I'm going to finish these two print statements, and I'm going to go back up and fix that. Thank you. And then lastly... Print spaces is equal to comma spaces. I'm kind of violating my own rule, which is compile or early, compile often, run the program before you type too much. I've typed like 100 lines of code here without actually checking to see if it works. Now that line was wrong. Is letter is not a function. The function is actually is alpha, standing for alphabet. In fact, there's a better way to do this. Yeah, I'll leave it alone, but uh, what am I doing there? Is alpha. Okay, I got distracted. I'm going to see if this works. All these print statements are kind of getting in my way. You don't have to do this, but I am going to cut all of that earlier code all the way down to the enter, all the way down to that block of comments where it says password is equal to input. I'm just going to cut that and put it in a separate chunk of code so that it doesn't keep doing it over and over. All right. Why? Because I don't want to see all that extra printing on the screen every time I run my password program. Okay, you need your new password. My password is password. Password analysis. Length is equal to 8. That looks right. Uppers. Lowers. Digits. Punks. Spaces. Well, some of these are not implemented. So I'm not sure which of those are accurate. I'm going to run it again and type in something that has all of the above just to see which ones it's actually picking up. Bob, space, Barker, space, one, two, three, exclamation mark, question mark. Something, you know, something that's got all of the cases. It figured it out. It's got two punctuations. It's got two spaces. In my case, it didn't count the number of digits, but that's okay. We didn't actually have that in our for loop. Didn't count the number of lowers. That's okay. We didn't put that in our for loop. Okay, I could have shortened the check for the uh, specials for the punctuation. I forgot 
that there's one more very useful one. I'm going to go and add this as a comment. Is alnum, standing for alphanumeric, true if a letter or digit? So I could rewrite this one here and take out this is digit or is alpha and replace that with a single call. I could just make that ch dot is alnum. All right, I do want to pause and make sure everybody's got this going before we go on. But it sure would be neat if I could do this. Uppers is equal to count underscore uppers. And then give it, you know, my password. Digits is equal to count underscore digits and give it, you know, my password. And then I wouldn't have to have this nasty for loop right here in the middle. Not that it's really nasty, but, you know, the code would look a lot cleaner if all I had to do was call some functions and it would do all the counting for me. Well, such functions are not built into the Python language, but we could write them. Another thing that would be really good to do would be for it to loop until you got a good password. We've done an analysis, but we haven't actually said whether it's a good password or not. So I think we're going to wind up writing a really big nasty if statement. Right, right. We could define our minimums. That'd be a good idea. But we're, what I'm also going to do is to have a flag called is good or something like that. And I'm going to set it equal to false, but then I'm going to decide if it's good based on these rules. And it's going to be a really long if statement, so we're going to break it on several lines. If the length is greater than or equal to 10, and that would be good to define it as a constant, and the uppers is greater than or equal to 2, that's the minimum number of uppercase letters, we don't have it counting lowercase, we don't have it counting digits, but we do have a counting punctuation. Pardon me. In lowercase right, right. We need to we need to have it reject the lowercase. So if the lowers is greater than or equal to two, now I'm going to use the backslash, the one above the enter key, in order to continue it on the next line. Is that going to work? Yeah. Looks like it's doing a division, but it's not the division is the other kind of slash so and the number of spaces is equal to zero and the number of punks is equal to zero have i taken care of all six things one two three four five six one two three four five yeah you're right punctuation needs to be greater than zero What am I missing? Length, uppers, digits. lower digits. Yeah. So, and digits greater than one. If all of that is true, it's a good password. Is good is equal to true. Now I'm regretting doing it this way because we're not giving them an error message as to what's wrong. Now we've typed three lines of code. Are we going to stubbornly stick to that three lines of code just because? Can you say else? Before? Well, we could, but you know we ought to tell them what's wrong. We ought to have a whole bunch of if statements. <coughs> what do I mean by that? Check one thing, and if it's not right, tell them. Check another thing. If it's not right, tell them. 
yeah, I kind of like if, else, if, else, if, that kind of thing, or just a whole bunch of if statements. I think that's what I'm going to do. Can't really think of how to preserve this and, and still do what I'm going to want to do. I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to just comment that out. I'm going to change this to is good is equal to true. We're going to assume it's innocent until proven guilty. So, if the length is less than 10, colon, print password must be 10 or more in length. Elif uppers is less than two. Print password must have at least two upper case letters. I'm going to skip lowers because we didn't actually implement the lowers counter. I'm going to skip digits because we didn't implement the digits counter. Elif punct is less than one or equal to zero. Either way we wanted to write it. Equal equals zero. Print password must have at least one punctuation symbol. Or one symbol. Our next case is if we have spaces. If we have any spaces at all, it's a problem. So if spaces is greater than zero, print password must have no spaces. And if none of that is true, one final else, colon, we need to set is good equal to false. Then we're just going to have a, an if statement at the end. If is good, print password good. Else, print password not good. Now that I'm done with that, I'm going to delete these three lines. So in a way that the uh, way that this is written is annoying. What do I mean by that? If it finds one problem, it's not going to tell you the rest of the problems. Like if you type in eight lowercase a's and nothing else, it's going to say, hey, must be 10 or more in length. And it's not going to tell you that, oh, by the way, it had to have a number and that better not have, you know, it had to have symbols and stuff like that. It's only because elif makes it mutually exclusive. Either that's going to happen or that, or that, or that. Or that. You can't have more than one of those things triggered based on this logic because they're all separated by else's. True is good, the last one be true. No, because it started off good and then if any of these things... Oh, you're right. I should have left that is good is equal to false. Very smart, Daniel. And then change this back to true. Sorry about that, gang. Definitely did not have enough coffee. Here we go. So if the password is good, I could just do if is good colon, or if I, I could do if is good equals true, whichever syntax you like. Print password is good. Else colon print. password not valid. That would be best is if we put it in a loop while is good equals false and then keep repeating asking them for it until they finally type in a good thing. Let me make sure it works. Please enter your new password. 
Bob. One, two, three. Password must have at least two uppercase letters. Mine did not. I'm just going to assume the rest of it worked, which is a really bad programming technique. You never assume. You always run it until you make sure that it works. But I'm going to do that because I'm fairly... No, no. I'm going to test each condition. No being lazy. Run it again. I'm going to put in two uppercase letters. Bob with two Bs. But password must have no spaces. See, that's what I mean, is it's only telling us one thing wrong at a time, which is really frustrating. Okay, so Bob with no spaces. Password must be 10 in length. That's about the time when you want to hit your monitor with a foam brick. Let's uh, run it again. Bob with two uppercase letters. One, two, three, some punctuation, and then we're going to add some more text. This is a really long password. Okay, there we go. Password is good. Okay, so that worked as far as we took it. What do I mean by that? It's not counting the number of lowercase. It's not counting the number of digits. So the improvements I would like to see in this program... This program is not finished yet. It's not counting the digits, not counting lowercase letters. And we're going to add a really stupid rule. The password must contain at least one uppercase Z. The programmer who wrote this program really likes the letter Z for whatever reason. So those are going to be the three rules that we add that we need to add. So lowercase letters has to be greater than or equal to two. Digits must be greater than or equal to 1, greater than 0. And the number of Z's. I'll let you figure out the logic for that. There's more than one way to do that. You could count the number of Z's or you could use that syntax that I did at the very beginning. You remember when I did this? If Z in password, that would work. You could do that. And then lastly, make the program loop until the password is good. That's going to be worth 15 points out of it. So you can still make a B and not make a loop, but if you make a loop, Tucking that away for later use. All right, anybody need syntax typo help? Because I know we typed in an awful lot of code and it won't fit on one screen.
All right, guys, we're going to flowchart this program up to the point where we've got it now. To do that, we need to remind ourselves of how to flowchart an ELIF because it's not quite as intuitive as you would think. Essentially, an ELIF, here's what people like, what they want to do, is they want to say if, and then they want to make this go back here and then make it go back here, you know, for everyone. But instead, it's gonna to have to have a line going all the way down to some junction underneath the entire structure. Why is that? Because ELIF means only one of these will trigger. Because if this one's true, it's not allowed to come back and check this one. If this is true, we're done, go to the end. If this one's false, then check that one. And if it was true, do that and then go to the end. You know, so at however many ELIFs we had, we're going to have some things branching off to the side and a line going down like that. Also, we're going to need to know. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so on the um, making it loop, like, like making it come back and come back, could you make it like uh, loop back and forth? If well, if we did while statements, the question is uh, concerning looping. If 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 we did that, let's let's just uh, I'm gonna write something here. For one thing, if I make this say while, it's gonna be a syntax error. But I'm gonna tack on the line about Z's. Here's one way you could solve the Z problem, except I'm gonna pick a different letter. If there's a question mark in the password, don't type this, guys, because this is wrong print no passwords all right so say I had that rule and then I went and said okay I'm just gonna make a loop what's that gonna do it's gonna print no password a million or it's gonna print no question marks a million times well we don't want to check we don't want to put whiles in the middle of the code what do I mean by that you don't want it to just check for upper cases over and over and you don't just want to check it for punctuation over and over instead you want the while loop to enclose the entire thing does that make sense because you're going to want to run the entire suite of checks and then if it's good yeah great leave else you're going to want to go back up to the top ask for the password and do the entire you know complement of checks again so your while statement is actually going to go way up here near the top. may even be the second line of code. It will be right above where you ask for the password because you want to let them type in a new password every time. So you'd put a while there and you'd tab everything over after it. That won't be the only change you have to make, but it'll... That's a goodly distance. Okay, so... I know everybody's trying to do the homework now. But we're going to do flow charts. So stop idling. <laughs> Go ahead and log into Lucidchart, please. This is part of the in class assignment. So I do want you to do it if I'm answering your question. No, I'm not planning on making you flowchart. I guess I could ask you to modify your flowchart with your changes, but I wasn't planning on doing that. <laughs> Wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> I'm going to need to kind of be toggling between the code and the flowchart, which is going to be a drag on my screen because my words are so large. Maybe that'll be enough. Oh. 
All right, so all flow charts begin with what symbol? Need the terminal. If this was a function with a DEF in it, we would put DEF in the function name there, but it's not, so we're just going to put start. The next thing we do is we ask for the password. So I'm just going to use a data block. Input password, that's enough. Yeah, I could use the exact syntax that was in the code, but that's overkill. They really messed this up by not allowing you to minimize this toolbar anymore. You used to be able to do that. Now the only thing you can do is... Oh, you mean, you mean for, yeah, yeah, right, right. Good idea, good idea. Then I don't need to reference my shapes nearly as often. So, if you want to avoid going over here to the toolbar, you can just grab a red circle, drag, and then pick your next shape. My next shape is going to be, I just entered the password, so I need all of these different things. Length is equal to the length of the password, uppers, lowers, digits, punctuation, and spaces. Now, I usually tell people to put everything in its own line, but if you're initializing a whole bunch of values equal to zero, I don't mind that being in a single box. Any other combination of code in a single box is probably not correct and you'll be, would be counted off for it. But, you know, if all that's doing is the same thing over and over, just using different variable names, upper Z is equal to zero, digits is equal to zero, I don't mind those going in the same box. But length is different because it's a completely different idea. We're calling a function. So length is equal to len password. If you wanted to word it more vaguely, like, you know, get length of password or something like that, or set length of password, that'd be okay. We could put the word set in it. So I hope you understand what I mean about putting multiple things in there in one line. Each each task, each line of code should generally go in its own symbol, unless you're just going to leave the symbol out entirely. Uh, I don't want you just cutting and pasting large chunks of the code and pasting it into your... But in this case, this is the same thing over and over. Uppers is equal to zero, digits is equal to zero, so I don't mind putting all of those in one line. And so I'm going to type something and I'm going to hit Control Enter to go to the next line. Because if I just hit Enter, it thinks we're done editing it. Keep forgetting to hit control enter. And I'm going to make an executive decision that we're going to skip all of these print statements. Maybe we'll just put one big, yeah, print password analysis. How's that for vague? You'd have to go back to the requirements to find out what that was. But that's not right. I haven't done the for loop yet. I'm going to just delete that line for now. So for. Fours are just like whiles. And ifs. So which shape are they going to go in? Yep, they go in the decision block, the diamond. For ch and password. Now I have a whole
whole bunch. Now I'm jutting off to the right because it's indented. And I have a whole bunch of if statements. If ch dot is upper. Or if I wanted to word it more vaguely, if ch is uppercase. If that's true, then we want to add one to the number of the uppers. That's math, so it goes in a regular rectangle. Now remember when I said that if you're using elifs, our line's going to go all the way down underneath the entire structure? Well, these aren't else's. So this line has to come back and hook up with that. So I'm just going to use a little circle there. And technically, you could get away with skipping a circle. I'll show you what I mean by that. But there we go. Hey. And then it's going to be another if statement underneath that. If I didn't feel like using these circles, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate that on the next one. If, after we check for uppers, we check for spaces. If ch is space, then we're going to add one to the number of spaces. If it's real obvious, then it's kind of okay to do this. You could skip the junction point and just immediately go to the next one. <laughs> if not space and not <laughs> alnum, alphanumeric. Actually, that's not how we worded it. I'm going to word it more similarly to how we actually have it in our code. If not, parentheses space or alnum. Alright, do you see what I mean by skipping the junction kind of made sense here? It wasn't too bad to leave off the little circle. If you like the circle, that's cool. I usually put it. In this case, I didn't. Alright, if it's not a space or an alphanumeric character, we need to add one to the number of punctuations. Now I am going to use a junction. Why? Because this stuff needs to join back together before going back up to the for loop. So now I regret even encouraging y'all to skip the junctions. What do I mean by that? Because the next, this is the end of the for loop. See, here's our for loop right there. We're done with it. So now we need an arrow going back up here to the diamond. So I really need something to draw the arrow from, so I need a circle down here. That's kind of dumb looking. Anyways. So that I can then have an arrow going back up to the for loop. Like that.
Okay. That is our analysis loop. We're tally, uh, tallying up all the uppers and the lowers and the digits and stuff like that, although we've skipped a few things. All right, now we're done with our for loop. I'm just going to drag a line straight down here. I don't know if I want to make this a big old long flow chart or to have it stacked in columns. I guess I'm going to make it a long one. What I mean by that, I could put a circle down here and then another circle up at the top and then keep going, you know, as long as the circle had a label, like an A and an A. But why not just go straight down? All right, here's our whole bunch of print statements. And I said I was going to shorten that to print password analysis, all the counters. So here's our story till now. I'm zooming in and out with the control key. Hold the control and the spin the mouse wheel. All righty. It's okay if you need additional time to drop to this point. If that's true, wave your hand, otherwise I'm gonna keep going. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going, but then I will print it out so that you can catch back up. Okay, so we are done with... Come on, you were supposed to minimize. Uh, yeah. Here's where we set our flag, is good is equal to false. By the way, when you do the looping, you're going to want to make that like the first line of code in your program, even above your while. Now we just have some if statements. If elifs. So, a that's a form of set statement, which is math, that's going to go in a regular rectangle. Is good equals false. Or if I felt like being pseudo Cody about it, I could put the word set in front of it. But I didn't do that earlier. So I'm going to leave that out. Right, the first if statement was the length. If the length was less than 10, we're going to print an error message. Print must be 10 or greater. Here's where I'm not going to immediately loop back. Why is that? Because these are elifs. I shouldn't say loop. I'm not going to put a connector right here and have them both come and join back together. When you're dealing with elifs, you kind of wait to draw those lines at the end. I'm about to hit the end of the page, but that's okay. So if uppers is less than two, elif 
uppers less than two. Print must have at least two uppers. Then we checked punctuation, so we have another if block. If punctuation is equal to zero, print must have at least one symbol. And then lastly, we checked spaces. One more if statement. <coughs> if spaces is greater than zero, it's a problem. And finally, we have an else. And I've said this before, but people wish that there was a symbol for else. There is for everything else. <laughs> Why not the else? But there's not. So generally what you want to do, or what I do anyways, is on the final else, regardless of whether you make it go off to the left or whatever, I change the wording of it a little bit. Where it says no, put the word else there. That satisfies my urge to actually see the word else in my flowchart. And you won't have any other prop that encourages that, so it's idiosyncratic. Hope they don't yell at you. You're not going to do much flowcharting in, in later courses. All right, and the last thing, I don't know why I put a data block there, because uh, under the else, what was there? It's math is good equal true. So I'm going to have to change that. A shortcut to changing it rather than deleting it and retyping it is to right click on it and choose change shape. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, now I have a problem, which is that I have a whole bunch of dead ends. All of this stuff needs to hook back up together. So I'm going to use a circle. And then all of these things need to hook back up to the circle. However you can arrange it to make it look good is up to you. crazy with this formatting. Wow, almost had it. All right, like that. That's how you do if else's. And I know I've zoomed out too far for you to read the writing, but in this case I did it because we were concentrating on the line. Underneath the last circle is going to be our stop. You know, so we need one more terminal down there.
All right, it's a very long flow chart. If I was thinking ahead, what I might have done is put this like over in one column. This could be real gasoline. I'm probably going to hit undo three or four times after I do this. Yep. <laughs> you know, and try to make it look like that. I'd have to arrange the lines a bit better if I was going to do that. You don't have to worry about stuff like that if, you know, you're doing it for me because I am fully aware that since this program lets us put an infinite number of pages on it, we may as well take advantage of it. Okay, so I'm getting tired of playing like that. I'm going to undo it. What I could have done is I could have put a, you know, an A here and an A there and it kept going. And then if I hit the bottom of the page, put a B there and then a B there and kept going. Another good thing to do would be to break this up into functions. Some things do not make for good functions. In, the, in this particular case, I'm not seeing good functions to do. This looks like it would be a good place for a function because it's kind of an isolated code, but unfortunately, it modifies a whole bunch of values. It modifies both the number of uppers, lowers, digits, punctuation, and spaces. And so, that's generally not... A function should return one value. Making a return three, four, five, six different values is problematic. So this actually would not be a good function. Maybe this one would be. Maybe that one could have been a function. And when, and, uh, when I say that one, the code that prints out the error message, you know. Maybe that could have been a, a single function. And then calling it, we just put it inside the box with the vertical bars. All righty. So looking at this, if you can see it, forgetting the, the actual code itself, if I'm going to make it loop, <coughs> what part of the code do I want to loop? Now, Victoria was thinking that the if statements down here could be involved in a loop, but not really because we don't just want to repeat that code over and over and over. What do we want to repeat? Pretty much the whole shebang. So we're going to put a wild diamond up there. We're not going to make this change on our flow chart. We put a wild diamond there. All of this would be indented under the wild diamond. And then the line going back up to it, you know, like that. So pretty much your while is going to be up at the top. Why is that? Because we're going to want to ask for a new password and we're going to want to update our counters every single time. So if we waited to start our while loop down here, we wouldn't be updating the counters. We wouldn't be getting a new password. It would just be looping over and over, printing error messages. Some of y'all got that to happen you know, over the break. All righty. So, if we were going to make some notes, we would call these string functions. Also, you can use the in keyword if there's a question mark in our password colon print no questions allowed like that oh. are there other things you can do with strings Let's go hit, I'm just going to go into Google and type Python string functions and see what pops up.
Okay, there's a lot of different ones. Make trans, L strip. Here's some other functions. Dot count. Dot count would count the number of Z's. Unfortunately, you have to specify a specific character. You can't just call dot count and ask it for all, you know, uppercase letters. But you could count the number of spaces that way, or the number, you know, of periods or something like that. That one's worth adding to our notes. ch dot is or count. I'm using ch just because our program did, but these are all string functions, really. So, you know, maybe I should have called them string dot is up or whatever. Maybe I should delete the ch entirely. Just, just go with me on that. So dot count returns how many Z's, how many times Z occurs. It can be a string rather than just a letter. In Python, a letter is a string. So you could do this. I love dogs and cats and candy and movies. Let's stick that in a string. S is equal to I love dogs and cats and candy and movies. Then I could do this. A is equal to S dot count how many times the word and appears. Then if I printed A, well, how many times did the word and appear? It appeared once, twice, three times. I had another and. E oh, oh, oh. Very good. It would count the and in candy. I hadn't spotted that. Three and words plus the andy in candy. So A is e or, or B is equal to S dot count O, lowercase O. That's going to be different. It's not counting, you know, anyways. We've got one, two, three O's, I believe. just keep looking for functions to add. There's a couple specifically that I want to mention. Convert to all uppercase. That's a very useful thing. Why is that? Because, you know, if you type, if you ask the user, please type yes to continue. You don't want to have to check to see if they capitalized just the Y or typed in the whole word in uppercase or the whole word in lowercase or whatever. You can just, up, you can just convert the uh, input into caps and then use that to base your decision on. So convert to all uppercase, convert to all lowercase, and then strip off the spaces 
from the end. That's actually more important than, uh, than we might be expecting. I'm going to say strip off all the white space. We will need that when we're reading in from a file. Not that important right now. But if we did this, string is equal to my name is Joe. And we had a whole bunch of spaces at the end because we read it from a file or whatever. We might want to be able to modify it so that it no longer had those spaces. And then lastly, split. I mentioned split when we were talking about lists. Split into a list. So we need all of those functions as well to tack onto our little list up here. I'm going to try to create a list right here. Count is one. That's the one we talked about. In fact, that's the only one we talked about. Okay. How do we strip off the, let's see, how do we convert to all uppercase? Convert string to uppercase Python. It's just I've seen capitalize. <coughs> this is crazy that um, this example here <coughs> is saying that they're using dot capitalize, but they're really using dot upper. There's, if there is a dot capitalize function, I would be surprised. Okay, so anyways. Let's go back in, maybe just to the shell, and play with some of these functions. So what I'm going to do is, well, I need to save that as my first set of notes. If you want to rename your notes to password or whatever to modify it to turn into as your homework, that'd be cool. Okay, so run Python shell. Get to your Python shell, close it and reopen it if it'll make it look prettier. I'm going to do n is equal to somebody's name, Bobby. And then I'm going to do n dot upper. That returned an all uppercase. n dot lower returned all lowercase. There's probably one that does initial caps as well. Yep, that's what capitalize does. If you type in dot and then wait a second, the pop-up comes up and shows you all the I've never gotten that to work reliably, so I've stopped trying to depend on it. Oh, it, it would help if I typed the uppercase in. Come on. Yay, all righty. You can see a whole bunch of different functions. A good programming editor... Microsoft calls it IntelliSense because they have to come up with a cool name for everything. Well, do some kind of autocomplete where you type in like a variable name or a function name or something and then it shows you a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, come on. Like that. And we could, we could scroll through and get a whole bunch of them. There's is alnum. We talked about that. Alpha decimal. That's an interesting one. Is identifier, I don't know what that would mean. Is lower, is printable. Is title, I don't know what that one does. A good programming editor would actually display an explanation of what that function does as well as the description. And when I say good, idle is fine. It's just a very small bare bones editor. And when you go on and you do Java development or C++ or something, you're probably gonna be using a much more sophisticated development environment either Visual Studio or, you know, Eclipse or, you know, there are other ones. They're called IDEs, Integrated Development Environment, and they can be very large programs that have a lot of functionality in them. Idle is a small editor. PyCharm, the one that we demonstrated, you know, is more flexible than, uh, more powerful than just idle. 
So, convert to all uppercase, ch dot upper, all lowercase, ch dot lower, convert to initial caps. I'm never going to ask you about that one again, but if you want it, there it is. CH dot capitalize. Strip off the white space. I'm going to go back to the shell and type in something that's got white space. Name is equal to space space Bobby followed by some spaces. And then name dot strip. There. What if you only wanted to take off the beginning white space? You use L strip because it's on the left side. And you use R strip if you only want to take off the end space. Name dot R strip is going to remove all the trailing spaces. Name dot L strip is going to remove all the beginning spaces, but leave the other ones. Notice that it's not changing the original value when I do this. See, when I type name, it's still got all the original data. If I wanted to keep that stripped data, you know, if I wanted to change it so I could print it out or something, I would need to do name is equal to name.strip. Now, that variable itself has been changed. So these functions are not changing the data, they're just reporting on it or they're, you know, returning a new version of it. And then if you want to do something with that new version of it, you have to store it back into something. So strip off the white space. We have three versions of that. We have strip, L strip, and R strip. R strip removes from the end. L strip removes white space from the beginning. removes white space from beginning and end. And if I was following the same convention up here, I really wish that I decided not to. You know, anyways, you have to prefix them with the name of the variable that you're stripping. You know. These functions up here is upper and is lower and is alpha will work on not just one character, but multiple characters. You don't have to put this because it's going to be in the middle of the nodes, but if I do name is equal to Joe, and then I do if name dot is upper, it's going to say no. It's going to say that that's false. Why? Because it's also got lowercase letters in it. So if I did if name dot is lower, it's going to say false because it's not all lowercase. If I do if name dot is digit, that's going to be false because it's not all digits. So these functions don't just work on single characters, they also work on entire strings. All right, we're going to do one more little bit of program. So I'm going to do a new file. I guess I'll call this one July 12, 
Odyssey or something. Because we've written several of them. What this one's going to do is we're just going to calculate the sum and the product, meaning the multipliers, of all the values between 1 and whatever n is. So, you know, maybe you've done the, you know, the kind of math where you have that special symbol and then you say 3 and that means 1 plus 2 plus 3 or whatever. We're going to do that. That's called summation. So, let's get a number to sum. X is equal to input. Summation of what number? Yeah, we, we'll type in whatever we want. And then we need to convert that to an int. Why am I saying int? Because summation, we're kind of assuming whole numbers. If you say sum all the numbers between 1 and 10, but then you start, you know, throwing in the decimals, 10.1, you know, 9.345, that wouldn't work. So x is equal to i and t x. Now I need a variable to hold my sum. What we're going to do next is kind of dumb because it could be rewritten with just a single line of code. I could do this. Total is equal to the sum. Nope, that's actually not going to work. Okay, that would not work. I could use sum as my var variable to hold the total, but it's a purple word. It's a function and I don't want to override it. So I'm going to use the word Total's the best word. I wish it said summation. That's too long. I guess I'm going to go with total. Again, we're going to initialize it to zero. Then we're going to have a loop that's adding on to it. So if I wanted to add up all the numbers between 1 and x... What kind of loop should I use? And there's more than one answer. I could use a while loop. I could use a for and a range loop. If I use for and range, it's going to be shorter. We could write it both ways. I'm going to use range for now. I'm almost wishing I was using a while loop. I'm going to use while. Change my mind. Okay. So, we need a counter in that case. Counter, or maybe just C, is equal to... Z. I think I'll start counting at 1. And then, while the counter is less than or equal to x, total plus equals x, and then counter plus equals 1. We will use this as a for loop as well, just to demonstrate it. We'll rewrite it. Here's how it would look as a for loop. We'd have to reinitialize total to zero. For, and we need some variable. I don't feel like using C because I was using that for counter. I think I'll use for V in range from 1 up to X plus 1. That's kind of why I didn't want to do it with a for loop is this business. Why did I need to do that? Yeah. It has to actually, if we say summation of 10, just to x is going to yeah, just to x would be up to 9. And I wish there was a better way to, to word that. I can think of another way. I'm going to leave it like that. <coughs> and then you would say total plus equals V. You can see that the for loop shortened it considerably. We took, you know, five or six lines of code and we shortened it to, to two. Having written that, I'm going to comment this out. 
I'm sure the while loop will work, but let's make sure. Print summation is comma total, and let's test it out. Not make the mistake of going super duper far. I'll be right there. Summation of what number? 10. Is that true? 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 is 100? I don't believe that. I made a mistake here. That's actually an equal sign. That means the exact, and that's actually where the error is. That means the same thing as total is equal to total plus x. What is, well, we started total off at zero, and then now we're going to keep adding the values to it because we're trying to add up all the values between 1 and 10 or something like that. That's what the definition of summation is. Add the values 1, 2, 3, etc., up to whatever they enter. Does that make sense? So we're taking in our loop, just like we were keeping track of bowling scores, each time we go through the loop we want to add a new score onto our total, and that's what that's doing. Are we good yet, or I need further explanation, which is okay? It's still wrong. I need to make that C, and so if that's what you're puzzling over, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, I was uh, asking you to explain wrong code, but uh, there we go. That is correct. And so I'll give you an example. Nah, just right on the board. I'm going to pretend that I'm a computer. And I have several variables going on. I have a variable named total, which I set equal to zero. I have a variable named C, which I set equal to zero. And then I have a variable named X, which is whatever they typed in. X is equal to input. So, say they type in five. X is equal to five. We've done that line, we've done that line. We've set total equal to zero. We've set our counter, I said zero, that's actually a one. Okay. While the counter, it wouldn't matter if, if we uh, made it zero, it would still work. While the counter is less than or equal to x, well, is c less than x? Yes. It is. So, what's the first thing we do? Total is equal to total plus c. Total is equal to zero. What's it going to equal after this is done? It's going to equal one because it was zero and we added one to it and we stored it back into it. Then we add 1 to C. C is equal to C plus 1. And my marker's dying. All right, now we go back up to the loop. Is C still less than X? It is. So total is equal to total plus C. Well, total is 1. We're going to add C to it and store it back into total. So 1 plus 2 is 3. C is equal to C plus 1. Increase C by 1. C is 3. Is 3 less than or equal to X? Yay or nay? Yeah. It sure is. 3 is less than 5. So total equals total plus C, or total plus equals C, if we'd written it like that as we had originally. What's total going to equal after that? Six. I'm looking at you because you were asking a question. Six. Yeah, 6. Okay, cool. I'm with you. Oh, okay. So if I'm belaboring a point, then I'm sorry. Then we increase that. This is called tracing a program by hand. Four is still less than five. Six plus four is 10. Add one to that. Is five less than or equal to five? Yes. It is. So total is equal to that plus 10 plus that is 15. We increment C to six. Is six less than five? No, it's not, so we're done. So when we printed it out, we would print total is equal to 15. And I hope that's what I actually get when I wrote it. Now, what I originally had was total plus equals x. What was wrong with that? It added x instead of c. Yeah, it added x, which was 10. It added 10 over and over and over, which is not what we wanted.
Okay, I'm going to change this total equals total plus C back to the original syntax. Total plus equals C. All right, we're going to write a new version that does the... I never remember the name of the uh, operation. You know how if you type in 10 <coughs> and hit the exclamation mark on your calculator, it'll, it'll tell you what 1 times 2 times 3 is? What is that called? Factorial. Factorial. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to do the same bit of stuff, except now we're going to calculate the factorial. Y is equal to input summation or factorial of what number? We need to convert that to an int. Okay, now I'm going to make a big mistake. You know what? I'm going to change these back to X's. Y so that I can just cut and paste this code down here. I'm highlighting those five lines. Total is equal to zero, C is equal to one and all that, and I'm coming down here and I'm pasting it. But that's not a factorial. A factorial is multiplication. So I need to change this plus equals to times equals. Or I could write out the whole thing. Total is equal to total times C. This has got a bug in it. And you'll earn a brownie point if you can tell me what's wrong with it. Well, I'm losing the value of x. That is true. Because I'm letting them type in a new x. And as a matter of fact, we could even just delete those two lines, you know. But there's going to be another problem. Yeah, that's what y'all were telling me. Yeah. That's what you were telling me. Okay. Thank you. There's another problem, though. All righty. So, <laughs> factorial is comma total. The problem is, is that it's always going to say zero. So, the summation of n number four, that's one plus two plus three plus four. Yep. The factorial of four, A. Oh, I typed a backslash in. Factorial of 4 is not 0. It's supposed to be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. Should be 24, I believe. So what do I need to do in order to fix that? Yeah, total is equal to 0 is not what we want to do because 0 times 1 is 0, and then times 2 is still 0, and then times 3 is still 0, and so on. Yeah, exactly. If we set total to 1, then, uh, then we'll be off to the races. So change that line. <coughs> change the 0 to 1. Also, the word total is kind of a bad... We should call it product, you know, but I don't feel like renaming all the variables. You'll notice that summation, excuse me, factorials get very large very quickly. Do the factorial of, you know, a uh, thousand. It's going to be a really large number. How large will Python let us go before it breaks? Factorial of a million. One, two, three, four, five, six zeros. Well, it's running forever. It's taking a long time just to calculate it. Do, 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 Okay, I'm getting bored. Maybe I should have just made it 10,000. Well, there we go. 
go. I finally figured it out. It's interesting that multiplying takes longer than addition. Did you see the way that it didn't hang when we were adding numbers, but it did hang when we were doing the multiply? Okay. That's neither here nor there. We have this cute little program here, and I'm going to want you all to flow chart it. Yeah, as long as we're starting with one, it's good. So, we could make that part of the homework assignment, or we could just do it in class before you go. That's what I feel like doing. This is going to be homework, but I'm going to give you all time in class to do it, so please don't just run for the door as soon as, you know. So, go ahead and work on it. And I'll be wandering around to help. Let me make a Dropbox for the in-class stuff we've done so far.